What is improvisation and how can it help us? Welcome to Act Social. In this film, you'll join me in discovering if applied improvisation in drama therapy can help us. In short, we've got conflicts, internal, with other people, and with society at large. We could use a little help in how we communicate with one another. Maybe the principles of improv have some lessons for us to learn in our society. In this film, we'll explore research about improvisation as well as its core principles. I wrote a letter about this to a man whose name is synonymous with improv comedy, Colin Mockery. He's the star of TV's hit improv comedy show, Whose Line Is It Anyway? Colin was just as excited as me about the possibilities improvisation holds for real life. In this film, you'll follow me as I meet Colin Mockery, other improvisers, and scientists who are exploring the extent to which improvisation can make our lives better. Improv comedy is a phenomenon, and two of its biggest stars, Colin Mockery and Brad Sherwood, tour the country performing a show that's different every single night. There you go. I knew if you just kept at it, you would have that problem solved. <laughs> what, you tack out your tongue? Not saying anything? I licked a chicken. Oh! <laughs> oh, yes, you did! <laughs> and now we're going to describe that chicken. I licked a chicken at RuPaul's house. No! <laughs> Don't give me a none of your back talk. I licked a chicken at my chiropractor's house. No! Uh-uh. <laughs> what are you looking at? Not quite sure. Yeah. I don't want any of your back talk, none of your... Sass. Yeah. <laughs> Go on. <laughs> I licked a sassy chicken. You did. So this whole thing started out with me wondering exactly how improv is done. We're here today in New York City to ask people if they know what improv is. Improv? Yeah. Improvisation. Improv. I don't know. Isn't it something like acting? <laughs> I wasn't listening. I don't know what that is. What is what? <laughs> when I started asking questions, it turned out that a lot of people don't know much about improv, and that's when I realized, oh. Improv's not actually that popular. I mean, when you compare it to something like soccer, where 300 million people are registered to play soccer around the world. But a soccer game is improvised. You don't know what's going to happen next. And think about the arts. Improvisation is nothing new to music at all. What we see like in Baroque music, there's something called figured bass, where the keyboard and the bass player and, and the lute player, they would improvise the exact chords that they were playing while at the same time they would have written down a framework of what the form of the music was. So there was improvisation in that tradition. If you move a little bit further ahead, we know for a fact that Beethoven and Mozart around that time period, improvisation was a big part of performance. So Beethoven really made a name for himself by being such a great piano virtuoso. And he would perform in these sort of cutting sessions with other pianists where they would invent on the spot. They would start with a common theme that they would both play. 
and then they would invent and improvise on top of that. And Beethoven was known in his day as being one of the greatest virtuosos on piano and one greatest improvisers. Getting the best of the best and start putting all the leaders of all the bands that there was back then. Here in New York, they call it Fania. From Fania All the Stars, they start putting everybody together, all the leaders. So they create a very, very good uh, band that was traveling all over the world. And I guess it's what was like the boom, that everybody was like, oh, salsa. And they call it like that because, for what I understand, is that they have a little of mix of different flavors and it's like salsa, right? You put different things and then you make your salsa, your sauce, right? So the same thing, they start putting different rhythms and they create the, the, the sauce. Of sort of like using the same tools, but kind of like improvise on your own, right? So you guys have the copas, you have the crossbody lead with a I little mean, bit you, of... I mean, they have everything. You have yeah. everything, so maybe play around with it. If you want to add hair whips maybe. instead of out here, but instead of here, maybe you just want to come out and twist or mix up the actual tools instead of doing it exactly in sequence. Because this, this documentary is about like how you can take what you learn and improvise. Because you already are prepared with your timing and your tools, now it's kind of like social dancing, but use the tools, if you can, that we use today. My name is Greg Emery, and I'm a painter. I do use improvisation in my work a lot. I lean heavily on improv in the sense that I step up and I don't know what's going to happen. The word improvisation means to me like practicing so much that when you step up to the plate to continue that reference or you step to the canvas or step on the stage, it not only feels natural but is natural. The average person might not understand improvisation, but we all realize that artists work very hard at their craft, and I think that is what fascinates us about the arts. My interest in improv grew out of my love for the theater. I started performing on stage when I was still in preschool. I quickly got addicted to the rapt attention and the applause. My parents recognized I was hooked, and they let me take acting classes, all culminating in my first big audition at the age of 10. It was for a musical, and I had practiced my song at home at least a hundred times, and I was ready. I got in there, and I sang my heart out, and good news, the director gave me a callback, or a second audition, on the spot. The only problem was, they tried to teach me a new song in just a few minutes. I wouldn't have time to practice repeatedly like I did my initial performance. I would have to improvise. I couldn't do it. In fact, I failed so badly three times in a row that the piano player had to stop each time before I could finish. The director, seeing I was out of my element, erupted at me. Don't try so hard. That was horrible. Go sit down. I had blown it. Was it nerves? I knew how to learn music. I knew how to sing. I loved performing. So what happened to me up there? Hi, my name is Cesar Jamie. Uh, I'm an improviser and actor in Chicago. I, I work for the I.O. Theater. I am a teacher uh, and I'm also a performer here and I also do corporate uh, workshops for a business called Business Improv. Uh, the Michael Bay incident uh, with Samsung about maybe six, seven years ago. Uh, Samsung had like their annual conference, right? There's like 10,000 people in the audience. And at the end, you know, the CEO comes out, uh, you know, and it's, it's the grand finale, kind of like, you know, so, and then, you know, our guest of honor, Mr. Michael Bay, this is when Michael Bay was like super hot and the, the place is going crazy. That's Michael Bay, you know, Transformers and Bad Boys. And um, they, they start to talk about, you know, they're about to unveil the little product. And uh, it's, if you don't know, when this stuff happens, it's always, uh, it's always scripted. So there's teleprompters, you know, so this stuff, they're, they're having a conversation and the prompters go off. And Michael Bay tries to answer the question, you know, that they were in their script thing, and midway through he goes, I'm sorry, the, uh, the prompter's off. And the CEO's like, okay, it's no, uh, no worries, we'll, we'll get it fixed, you know, in the meantime, let's just kill some time, let's just talk. So what do you think about our product, huh? Pretty cool, right? And uh, Michael Bay tries to, you know, go along with it, you know, it's like, yeah, you know, it's, uh, you know, mm. I'm sorry, the, the prompter's off. And the CEO is like, whoa, this guy's, this, how's this happening, right? This is, you know, so he, he throws him a bone. He's like, you know what, uh, forget about this. Tell me about you. 
tell me about how did you get into directing, you know, all this stuff, which anyone can answer. Just tell me, your, just tell me about yourself. And Michael Bay tries to answer, then he just walks off stage. And the next day, every improv theater in the country tweeted at him, take an improv class. Hi, my name is John Acorn. Um, I'm an actor, teacher, um, writer, director. That happened on the Kennedy Honors the other night with, with uh, uh, Kevin Klein. He was in the middle of this great tribute, right? And uh, uh, suddenly somebody sneezed really loud in the audience. He said, bless you, the audience laughed. A small laugh, not a derisive laugh, but it was because it's alive. It, it tells you that we're alive. And as Carla would translate improviso, it means all of a sudden. That's what it is. So if you're improvising, you're creating something all of a sudden. I just went to see uh, over the holidays, I was back in New York with my daughter, and we went to see Betrayal, but with Tom Huddleston. It brilliantly directed, brilliantly conceived, an incredible show. And at one point, the two guys are sitting down, and uh, they both know, or they're learning, one's learning the other has known all along about the fact that the other guy's been sleeping with his wife, and they're eating melons and prosciutto. And Tom Huddleston is doing this thing, and he's stabbing and stabbing his food. And then a little piece goes down and hits the floor. And he looks at it. And the other guy starts to go and held character. And Huddleston was looking at him, looked at the thing, reached down with his fork, went boink, gunk, and went on. And the audience went up, knowing that no other audience would ever see that. That wasn't planned. That was in the moment. That was our special, that was our $200 worth of seats. To, that was our, our pleasure, right? Audiences love that. It was like the sneeze at the Kennedy Center. It's like, it's an acknowledgement that the audience is there. So I started to worry that maybe only some people are able to improvise and others aren't. I'm Nisha Sashnani. I'm the director of the Drama Therapy Program and the Theater and Health Lab here at New York University. And in the Theater and Health Lab, we do research on the health benefits of theater making. So that includes improvisation, storytelling, performance, all of the building blocks of what we would associate with the theater. Uh, we're improvising real life all the time, aren't we? Nobody gives us a rule book for that. And it requires a heck of a lot of skills to be able to negotiate the kinds of challenges that come our way. I'm David Johnson. Uh, I'm a drama therapist and a psychologist. Each of us is thrown into this world and we imagine we have a plan for the next moment, as if we can predict it. But there is no way to predict the next moment. And if you really are aware of that, it's terrifying. So improv is a way of kind of dealing with the absolute lack of ability to predict the next moment and throw yourself into it anyway, without a script. I started to become fascinated with the idea of how people developed a lightning fast improvisational mind. And I was surprised to hear about the miraculous stories resulting from using improv. I'm Patricia Ryan Madsen, and I was on the faculty at Stanford um, theater department. So I was the um, faculty member who introduced improvisation to the curriculum. I wrote a book that was published in 2005 called Improv Wisdom. I got a letter from a woman and she says, Dear Patricia, you may not remember me. I was in one of your improv classes and um, I, I wanted to let you know how, how what I learned in that class has been of use to me. Um, she said, uh, six months ago, I, I woke up in a hospital and I had been in a coma for nine months. And at the time I woke up, I could not speak. I could not move. I was still fully paralyzed. And I found myself now uh, with my eyes open in a hospital room. Uh, and I was told that I had uh, been in a coma for nine months. And she said, of all the things that came back to me, she was, had been a psychologist, she said all my spiritual ideas and all of my um, notions of psychology, 
the odd thing that came to me at this strange moment when I couldn't speak or move were the ideas of uh, improv. He said, well, I can kind of pay attention. I can show up and see what's happening. I can, um, if I try stuff, I, I'll make mistakes, that's okay. Um, let's just see what happens. And she said, the, the principles of improv got me through a, an impossible situation. And as I began to then recover some of my mobility, she said, um, when the physical therapist would um, pull me out of bed and I would, um, she said, I, I imagined I was doing an improv scene and I was playing uh, a little uh, fawn that couldn't walk yet. And I was just trying to do my best. And she said, being, playing improv games as I came through this and out of this um, kept me, uh, kept me alive and helped me negotiate a, a kind of impossible situation. So thanks. Thanks, improv. I'm here in the city of Chicago, which is the home of improv, improv comedy. Chicago is known for the Second City, the Annoyance, and the Improv Olympic, where thousands of people come each year to learn the secrets of great improv comedy. My name is Kristen Kruger. I am a clinical psychologist. So I started the study probably in 2013, 2014. That's the way you get down. We looked at uh, symptoms of depression, anxiety, self-esteem, uh, satisfaction with social roles, and perfectionism. And so after just four weeks, uh, two hours a week, we found that there was a significant difference in paired T tests uh, in uh, mood, so mood improved, anxiety symptoms uh, were uh, decreased, and uh, self-esteem was um, significantly improved. There was a trend towards reduction in perfectionism, um, and there was no effect essentially for um, satisfaction with social roles. So this study, although small and it's not controlled, uh, we did not have a control group, um, has given a lot of hope for people who want to study this. My name is Scott Kenicky. I am the Neurotherapy Director at Kalo Programs. I oversee all the QEG evaluations and all the protocols that we develop for our neurofeedback intervention. Um, I got into this because when I was in St. Louis, I'm from originally from St. Louis, I was in the St. Louis family court systems there. Um, I was working in the detention centers and I found that um, the detention centers were highly punitive and as a counselor that was really uncomfortable for me on a lot of different levels. So I came to Kalo. Kalo was a relational program. Uh, it really focuses on the relationship between the student and caregivers. My name is Mary D. Michelle, founder of One Rule Improv, and I have been teaching, performing, and writing about improv for over two decades. All right, so what is complex developmental trauma? So complex developmental trauma is caused by the chronic exposure to traumatic events between the ages of zero and seven, and involves an interruption to the relationship between the caregiver and the child. So for reasons such as sickness, death, stress, poverty, violence, war, abuse, neglect, the caregiver is unable to respond to the child's needs with consistent, sensitive, appropriate responses, which are necessary for healthy brain development during that time. Very well-established therapies, they start from the assumption that the person, is, that their brain's online, that it's fully integrated, that everything's working. And if someone has suffered from the effects of developmental trauma, that's not the case. Their brains are like offline. They're, they're not fully integrated. The, the higher cortical functions aren't quite activated the way they should be. This brain map image depicts the power of brainwave activity of an individual student prior to and after 20 minutes of improv. White indicates normal and colorization indicates deviation. 
The first row on the left shows normalization in delta, which would indicate improvement in attention and cognition, while the two rows on the right show changes in beta and high beta, indicating physical relaxation and the release of muscle tension. So what we found was improv does get the brain back online, helping students better connect with themselves and others. I asked our students how improv made them feel, and one student said, improv's like swimming. You don't have to go through the ugly. And I said, what do you mean? And she said, you see in therapy, therapy, that's like track, that's running. You get all sweaty and your muscles hurt and you gasp for air and sometimes you even cry, but you have to go through all that to get to the better, but not with improv. In improv, you do all the work, but you don't feel it. You don't even feel the sweat. So you get to the better without having to go through the ugly. Improv is like swimming. Colin and I were both really curious about the science behind improv. So he agreed to get into an MRI machine and have scientists look at his brain while he improvised. Of musical things that are simple, based on nursery rhymes. Okay. Now, we want you to have the memorized versions very clear in your head. So Mary had a little lamb. Yeah, Mary had a little lamb, little lamb, little lamb, Mary had a little lamb. Yes, exactly. Everywhere that Mary went, Mary went, Mary went. Everywhere that Mary went, Mary went, Mary went. Mary went. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 And I have a backtrack there for you, too. Yeah. Yeah. I'm making Yeah, everyone is uh, so Canadian. <laughs> <laughs> From Montreal. Hey there. Okay, so remember, it's going to be Mary had a little lamb, wheels on the bus, old MacDonald had a farm, happy birthday, twinkle twinkle little star. Do you need to go over the words on any of them? Uh, I think I'm okay. And then when it's improvised, we're going to substitute the title to, we're going to adjust the title and then you're going to sing lyrics to the new adjusted title. Okay. Old MacDonald had no arms. Old MacDonald had no arms. E-I-E-I-O. It made his work so very hard. E I E I O. He could not hoe, he could not hoe. There ho, there ho, someone else had to hoe. Bill McDonald had no arms. Boy, oh boy, oh boy. Old McDonald had no arms. E I E I O. He had to milk and use his mouth. E I E I O. <laughs> I can't believe this is our job. Yeah. <laughs> I say that all the time. <laughs> <laughs> that was fantastic. That was good. You just let all those cushions fall away from you? We have we have other uh, a lot of other images here. Well, I just had my uh, brain scanned. It was quite the experience. You know, going into it, I was worried that um, I wasn't really sure if I was claustrophobic or not. Um, I was worried about having to lie still for a long time and yet improvise. But it was uh, fairly painless. The last fifteen minutes were um, hell, hell. <laughs> just because the ear things were pinching, but um, you know, I, I remembered what my wife said whenever I complain about pain, it's not childbirth. So I just breathe through it.